Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to this uh, Wednesday uh, session of the Strings 2020 conference. I think it is Wednesday now uh, everywhere in the world where we have uh, people at the conference. And uh, our first uh, speaker of this uh, session is uh, Nathan Seiberg from the Institute uh, for Advanced uh, Study. And uh, Nathan uh, will give us uh, a review of uh, fractons uh, for field theorists and uh, field theory for fractons. So uh, please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, at least one person. Uh, first, I think I can speak for the entire string community and thank the organizers here for putting together this fantastic conference during such an unusual and stressful environment. This is really, really highly appreciated. I also want to, I want to thank you for inviting me to speak here. Finally, I want to thank my friends and collaborators, these people, can you see the pointer? Uh, can you share your screen again, Nadi? We can't see this. Oh, screen. I didn't share the screen. So let me start and share the screen. I have to start from scratch. Where do I search? Can you see the screen now? Uh, yes, but not in the full screen mode. You don't see the full screen mode? No, no, no now it's great. Good. Uh, so finally this worked. Uh, and you can also see now the list of people that I would like to thank. These uh, people listed here at the bottom. And I thank them for many discussions and fruitful collaborations. They shaped my view on the subject, and today I will share that view with you. So this talk is a, a review talk, and as such, the talk will have two parts. The first part of the title is more of a review. This will be factors for field theorists or for string theorists, so it's more of a review. And the second part would be more modern, where we'll try to cast the subject in fractals in the context of field theory. The first question we should address is, why should we discuss it here? This is a string conference. Why should we talk, be talking about string theory, about fractals? And the point is that I view quantum field theory as a language of physics. It appears everywhere. It has many applications. It has been enormously productive and useful over the last uh, several decades. And it's particularly prominent in various aspects of string theory. We have heard a lot about quantum field theory in the previous talks in this conference, and I'm sure we'll also hear a lot about it later during this conference. So quantum field theory appears to be everywhere, and we should be able to use it everywhere, except that over the past several years, and these are developments that I will review, uh, mostly from condensed matter physics, but also from other communities that I will again review soon, a new lattice systems were presented. They look quite standard and innocent, and they exhibit bizarre properties, properties that do not seem to fit the framework of quantum field theory. So there are two logical options. One is quantum field theory just cannot describe these phenomena. We shouldn't even attempt to describe these phenomena using quantum field theory. And the second option is that quantum field theory should be extended, extended such that it can accommodate this uh, strange phenomena. Now, this is a very dangerous undertaking. And if we try to do that, we're really walking on very thin ice because the logical structure of quantum field theory is very, very tight. It barely makes sense. And as such, so it does make sense, but if we try to change the rules a little bit, we are running a danger that we might find something which is totally inconsistent. So we'll have to tread very, very carefully as we try to do that. So in the coming slides, I will give a very brief description of the history of the topic of fractals, and mostly the timestamps and highlights of points. And later, I will discuss these developments over the last several years. I'll discuss them and review them in more depth. So the history of the subject is also very interesting. 
And it started with, I think, two papers. That's the fair reference. These two papers, one by Shamon from in 2004 and the second by Ha, 2011. Notice the seven year time difference between these two papers, showing that this paper had very little impact on the subject. And this was kind of the, the first time the impact started appearing. And I quoted here the titles of these two papers to show what these people were really motivated in. So the first title of Shamon's paper is quantum glassiness in strongly correlated clean systems. An example of topological overprotection. overprotection. Hans paper, this one is really a paper about quantum information theory. And he talks about local stabilizer codes in three dimensions without string logical operators. And it's clear from the titles of these two papers that they were not interested in, or they were not motivated by the way we think about fractals today as being interesting phases of matter. So it took until 2015 and 2016 with these two papers PJ by PJ High and Fu. I will review these papers very soon. So it only in 2015 and 2016 the significance of these models for describing phases of matter uh, was realized. Notice the time span of 12 years from Shamon's paper till 2016. This is really a very long time. And the titles of these two papers show really the change in perspective, a new kind of topological quantum order. So they realize that this is a new phase of matter. In the mention of hierarchy of, they talk about quasi-particles and excitations. And here they talk about fractal topological order, generalized lattice gauge theory, and duality. So that sounds more like the language that we will pursue uh, today and also in this talk. So in the subsequent years, after 2016, the floodgates were open and many papers were written. Many more examples were found. So it turns out that these examples that were that appeared in the first few papers are not uh, isolated. There are many, many examples. And including some development that I will review later of gapless models by Pretko in 2016, and which were associated with very strange and funny gauge theories, first proposed by Shu, again for totally different reason in condensed matter physics. The other development I will review is in these two papers, Male, Shen, and Hermili, and VJ in 2017, with the so before that, there were many other constructions for fractal models, but in this paper, they propose models which are based on taking two plus one dimensional lattice systems and putting them on a putting this on a layer, a layer in two plus one dimensions, and stack the layers in the z direction. So in the z direction, we have a, a bunch of two plus one dimensional field theories, and then we take another stack and stack them in the x direction and in the y direction. And we introduce some couplings between the stacks so that we end up with the three plus one dimensional field theory. So this is thinking of the three plus one dimensional theory as a stack of layers in two plus one dimensions. And to connect to string constructions, this is similar but quite different than stacks of D-brains that are popular in the string community. But perhaps we can do something from the D-brain constructions uh, to learn about this subject. During these years, there were also many other connections to many other branches of physics, including theory of elasticity. So these theories involve some tensor fields, and this is connected to the elasticity tensor. More connections to quantum information. In fact, this whole field started from quantum information theory. And of course, connection to topological quantum field theory in the sense that these theories of fracton look like a generalization of quantum field theories, kind of the next step in a logical progression. Now, I should apologize. This is a huge field with lots of papers, and I will not be able to do justice to all these developments. So I will be very brief here, and I picked only some of these highlights. So in the coming slides, I'm going to take some of these highlights from some of these points from the time frame that I described and discuss them in more detail. And first, I would like to discuss this model by Vijay Hein Fu. It's known as the X-cube model. 
So this is a lattice model in three plus one dimensions. So we start from a three dimensional cubic lattice and we put the Z2 spin on every special link. This is a picture from the lattice and on every link. Can you see my pointer? Yes. Ah, good. So on every link, there is a Z2 spin or in modern language, we say there is a cubit or in an old fashioned language, this is an IC spin. So we have a finite box uh, with periodic boundary conditions. So finite number of spins, every one of them has two states and the Hilbert space is the product of these states. And then we have to pick a Hamiltonian. So these people took the, pick the particular Hamiltonian. In the case of icing, the spins are at the sides of the lattice and the interaction is coupling between the two spins. In the case of the X cube model, the Hamiltonian is a sum of two kinds of terms, some of the lattice, some of the cubes of the lattice, and another term, which is the sum of the sites of the lattice. So let me describe them in more detail. The first term is a cube interaction. On every one of, we pick a cube, say this one, and we go around the cube, there are 12 links, and on every link, we put the operator sigma one that acts in the two-dimensional Hilbert space of that spin. So we multiply all of them around this cube, and then we sum them over the lattice. The second kind of term is associated with the sites of the lattice. So we pick a site, say this one, and we look at the xy plane. There are four links touching the sites, touching this site, and we multiply sigma three of these operators. So when we write sigma three here, what we mean is sigma three acting in the Hilbert space of this particular spin. So we multiply them together and we'll repeat that in the two other directions. So we have here, this is AZ, what we wrote here is AZ, but similarly we have AX and AY. And we add all these terms together and that's the Hamiltonian. The first thing I would like to emphasize about this Hamiltonian is that it is innocent look, innocently looking. There's nothing funny about this Hamiltonian. We have a finite dimensional Hilbert space. The interactions are completely local. All spins interact only with their neighbors or maybe next nearest neighbors or next to nearest neighbors, but there are no long range interactions. So superficially it does not look conceptually different than the IC model. This will end up not being the case. This is quite different than the IC model, even though it looks so innocent. The second thing which is special about this particular Hamiltonian is that all the terms in the Hamiltonian commute with each other. So the first that all these terms commute with each other is obvious because they're constructed only out of sigma one and all the sigma ones commute. The fact that these terms commute with each other is also clear because they're constructed only out of sigma three. So they also commute with each other. What's a little bit less obvious, but it's completely straightforward to check is that every term here from every side commutes with every term here for every cube. And we just have to go and check where these uh, objects can touch because only if the two operators act on the same spin can they fail to commute and they all commute. And if they can all commute, we can diagonalize all of them simultaneously. So all the terms in the Hamiltonian commute, and therefore the lowest energy state is when all these terms are equal to one. And if, so now we have just a counting problem. All the states are equal to one. And we can ask how many different states are there such that all the, all the states, uh, all the terms in the Hamiltonian equal to one. And the answer is this formula. So we work on the torus with periodic boundary conditions. We have LX sites in the X direction, LY sites in the Y direction, and LZ sites in the Z direction. And this is the total number of ground states of the system. This formula should be shocking. It should be shocking because of several different peculiarities of First of all, the number of ground states of the system depends on the number of lattice sites. Normally in the system, we have either one ground state, that's the standard situation, and if we have spontaneously broken discrete symmetry, we can have more than one ground state, and in a topological field theory, we can also have more than one ground state. But the common thing in all of them is that the number of ground states in finite volume is finite. There's a finite number of ground states in finite volume. Here, the answer is infinite. And it's infinite when we take the lattice size to infinity. And the number of ground states depends on the number of sides. So imagine we make the lattice a little bit bigger by adding another layer 
so that Nx goes to Lx plus one. This is an infinitesimal change. So if you think of taking a chunk of material, we just put, we just paint it on, the, on, on one side. So we just put one layer of atoms. The number of ground states is multiplied by four. So this is very surprising because it shows that even the number of ground states depends on microscopic details. The second surprising thing is that the exponent here, so the exponent here is the entropy. It's the logarithm of the number of states. This is the entropy. And the entropy is normally finite, or it could be extensive, proportional to the volume. Here it is infinite, but the infinity is proportional to the length of the system, not to the volume. It's been referred to as sub-extensive. It's extensive in the sense that it grows with, with the number of sites, but it's sub-extensive in the sense that it grows only linearly in the size, not linearly with the volume. Finally, if we try to take the continuum limit, and I'll be very precise what I mean by the continuum limit, we put a lattice spacing, we set a lattice spacing to zero, sending the number of sites to infinity, holding the physical size of the system fixed, Li is fixed. As we do that, the number of ground states is infinite. So if we want to find a field theory description of that, we'll have to learn to live with a system that has an infinite number of ground states, not only is it going to be infinite, this infinity is going to depend on the values of Lx, Ly, and Lz in this peculiar way. Putting all this together, we see that the ground states reflect short distance physics. If we add another lattice of another a layer of sites, we don't change much at long distances, but this affects the number of ground states, and the number of ground states grows as we do that. This is the hallmark of UVIR mixing. We are used to UVIR mixing in the context of a theory of gravity. In the theory without gravity, UVIR mixing occurs, <clears throat> UVIR mixing occurs in non-commutative field theories. And here we have another theory which exhibits this peculiar UVIR mixing. The long distance physics depends on the details at short distances. A few more details about the peculiarities of the model. The spectrum is gapped, so we talked about the ground states and then there is a gap. And it has very strange conserved charges. In the quantum information theory, they're called logical operators. They act on the space of ground states. So logical operators are operators that commute to the Hamiltonian and act in the space of ground states. In physics language, if it commutes with the Hamiltonian, we say it's a conserved charge. And if it's act in the space of ground state, we say that this is a symmetry that in the infinite volume limit is going to be spontaneously broken. So in any event, we have a very large number of conserved charges. And the conserved charges do not act on all of space simultaneously, but they act only on the xy plane at fixed value of z. And then there's another conserved charge acting on the xy plane at another value of z, and yet at another value of z. So at every, at every position, we have a separate subsystem symmetry. So we have an infinite symmetry group, but it's a global symmetry. The next well, interesting object uh, fact about this model is that there are no local operators acting on the space of ground states. So every local operator in the theory, there are lots of local operators we can construct out of these things. If we act on the ground state, we find an excited state. It does not act within the low energy states. This is extremely significant because it means the system is robust. If we take the short distance Hamiltonian and we perturb it a little bit, then this would be described at low energies by slightly perturbing the low energy system. But the low energy system doesn't have any local operators acting there. So therefore, as long as the deformation at short distances is small enough, the long distance behavior is robust and stable. This means that we don't really have to start with precisely the Hamiltonian that was written before. In the neighborhood, of the, in the space of couplings, the answers remain the same. <clears throat> the excitations are also very strange. They have restricted mobility. So the first kind of excitation are fractals. These are point particles, particle-like excitations, but they are stuck at the point and they cannot move. No matter how much energy you give them, you cannot move them from one point to another. They're not created by local operators. If, if you could create it with a local operator, you could act with 
local operator to annihilate the fractal, the opportunity is stayed at one position and create it elsewhere. But these articles are not created by local operators. Instead, they are created by operators that look like a rectangle or membrane operators. And then they are created at the four sides, you don't see, at the four corners of the rectangle. So we can act with a rectangle and it creates four excitations at the four corners. This means that even though the fractal cannot move, the operator of the fractal cannot move, if we can annihilate the fractal at the expense of creating three other fractals elsewhere. So it's very strange behavior. There are also particles called linons, and they are fixed to move on the lines, either the X or the Y or the Z direction, but they're not allowed to move diagonally. And there are planons that are fixed to be on the plane, either the XY plane or the YZ plane or the XZ plane. And these are really dipoles of these fractals. So all these things are not something that we postulate from outside. They follow from that innocent looking Hamiltonian. So we started with an innocent looking Hamiltonian. It turned out to be solvable. And all these peculiar features follow. Next, I would like to review R's code. R's code came earlier, but it's even more bizarre than the X cubed model that I have just described. Here we have two qubits at every site. And there are two kinds of interaction terms in the Hamiltonian. It's again, some of the cubes. At every corner of the cube, we have a two qubits, two spins. And when we write one sigma one here, we mean one acting on the first qubit and sigma one acting on the second qubit. And we multiply these products of sigma ones on one cube. And then we add to it the product of sigma threes on the same cube, and then we sum over the lattice. And again, this is an innocent looking Hamiltonian, only spins, Z2 spins and local interactions, nothing looks strange here. And it again has this property that all the terms in the Hamiltonian commute. And here, the bizarre features are even more bizarre than in the X cube model. I'm only going to mention one of them, and that's the number of ground states. The number of ground state is still two to a power that depends on the number of sites in the lattice, LX and LY and LZ. But the function k that appears here in the exponent, if you wish the entropy, is a complicated number theoretic function of Lx, Ly, and Lz. It's much more clear in the x cube model, it's linear, but here it's more complicated. And you can hop around, even if all of them are equal. So we take all the sides equal, so it's a function of one integer. Even that is a very complicated function, and even that can hop around. It hop around in the sense that it's more, not monotonic in L. So before, when we add another layer of a size, the number of ground states grew. In this system, it can go up, it can go down. It's bounded by a term roughly proportional to L, but it can go down to a finite number and then go up again. So in this case, we can find sequences of size of the system as L goes to infinity with finite limit for K of L, or we can find sequences where K of L diverges as in the X cube model. So this really raises the question, what is the limit is L going to infinity? In the X cube model, it was infinite and said, well, we'll have to learn to live with it. And now there isn't even a well-defined limit. Depending on how we take the limit, we get a different answer. And we could ask, is there a continuum limit at all? The next kind of model that I would like to discuss was introduced by Pretko. And these models are gapless. So the previous two examples I mentioned are gap. These are gapless models. And he was interested, but he was motivated by a very strange gauge theory that was only described, introduced by Shu for totally different reasons. Here we have a gauge theory where the time component of the gauge field, A0, is standard gauge transformation node. It's shifted by B0 alpha. But the spatial components are not a vector that carries one index, but it's a tensor that carries two symmetric indices. Very much like gravity, but it should not be confused by gravity. This is not a theory of gravity. So the gate transformations are as spelled out here. A0 is shifted by D0 alpha, and AI gate is shifted by DI DJ alpha. And then we can form gauge invariant combinations, electric field and magnetic field, which are certain tensors in the indices, and you can check that under this gauge transformation, this E and this B are invariant, 
And we can write a Lagrangian, which is roughly e squared minus b squared. And we can analyze the spectrum. And this theory has gapless photons. So the photons, which are the plane wave solutions of this system and latencies. Now, what Pratt could notice is that this gauge theory has an interesting property. These are the gauge transformation nodes. And Gauss law, which is normally one derivative on E, which has one index, here Gauss law involves two derivatives acting on E with two indices, and that's the charge density law. So if we add matter fields, charge matter fields to this system, this is the form of Gauss law. And as a result, both the charge and the dipole charge are conserved. To see that, we substitute this double derivative term in here, and then we can integrate by parts. And because we have two derivatives here rather than one derivative, as in the ordinary case, we can also integrate here by parts. And as we integrate by parts, we see that the total charge, and the total dipole charge, depend only on what's going on at infinity, and therefore they are conserved. So as a result, Pretko realized that the charge excitations of this system have restricted mobility. They are constrained both by charge conservation and dipole conservation, and they are fractals. I'd like to present a slightly different interpretation, equivalent but different interpretation of this statement that would be easier to generalize. The discussion here works on non-compact space. So we check the electric field at infinity and we talk about charge conservation. After all, charge here is a gauge charge. So I think it's better to think of the theory without matter fields and represent the matter fields as defects. So we think of probe particles in the theory without, matter, without dynamical matter fields, and that theory has defects. And the defects are represented by Wilson lines. So of course, if we look at Gauss law in the presence of the Wilson line, we're going to, going to get a delta function at the location of the defect, and that would be the charge density that appears here, except that it's classical. But here comes the crucial point. In a normal theory, this defect in the time direction can bend in space by using the existing AI, by introducing the vector, using the vector potential. In our theory, there is no AI. And since there is no AI, the defect cannot bend. And as a result, this particle cannot move from one place to another. I use, so this is a, kind of another interpretation of this fact, which works also in finite volume, but we don't need the charge at infinity. The last development I would like to review in my historical part of the talk is the couple layer construction. I mentioned it briefly earlier in when I presented the timeline of the, develop the historical development was done in these two papers. In this paper, in these two papers, they study two plus one dimensional lattice systems on a layer and saying the x, y plane. And then they stack these layers along the z direction. So, so far, the different layers are completely decoupled from each other. So three plus one dimensional space is constructed out of a stack of two plus one dimensional layers. And then you can repeat that in the two orthogonal directions. So this is the x, y direction. You can repeat it in x, z and in the y, z directions. And then add some coupling between the stacks. We'll soon discuss why this is a good thing to do. I want to mention two more modern development. One is by these authors who said that such a stack construction can be taken to curved space. So far, the models were in flat T3, but these authors suggested that such a stack construction can be taken to a curved space, provided the manifold, the space manifold, is foliated and the leaves of the foliation, are these layers are along the leaves of the foliation. And more modern development was based on putting a the continuum theory on the layer, not a lattice model, but a continuum field theory, continuum topological field theory on each layer, and couple these TQFTs in, in the stack in one direction, in the other direction, and in the third direction. So why is this a good thing to do? Some properties of the fractal models become manifest and intuitive. The first fact is the restricted mobility. So we're going to have excitations that are stuck on one layer. They cannot move from one layer to another, nor can they move along the other. So they can move, they're stuck in these layers and they cannot move in this direction. 
And then there would be similar ones if they're stacked on the orthogonal layer. So that's the first thing that is nice about it. We can also have excitations that are stuck in the location where two layers intersect each other. So the X, Y, and the X, Z. So this would be excitation that can only move along one line, the X direction. And finally, those that are restricted with, to be at a position where the three layer, the three orthogonal layers, all three of them touch at the same point. So this would be the fractal. Second, I mentioned the subglobal, the subsystem global symmetry. In this case, they can be interpreted as a symmetry that acts only on one layer, but not at the other. So that gives a nice interpretation of why we have this subsystem global symmetry. It also gives an intuitive picture for the sub-extensive ground state they cannot see. So imagine we put the field theory, which has the four ground states on each layer. So this is a torus, and this is a ZPVH theory, it has four ground states. Then the number of ground states would be four to the power of the number of layers. And if we also add the stack in the other directions, we can just multiply all these numbers and we roughly get the answer that is obtained earlier. So thinking of three dimensional space as the couple field theories or almost the couple field theories on these layers explains all these facts. The crucial aspect is that it makes clear why the observables are discontinuous because the charge on one layer has nothing to do with the value of the charge in another layer. And observables in one layer have nothing to do with the observables in the other layer. This thing really means that taking another continuum limit as we take the, all these layers together is going to be challenging. In other words, this theory can is perhaps be made, set, can be made sensible as a continuum field theory on each layer. But if we try to make take the number of layers to infinity, we have a genuine three plus one dimensional continuum field theory. We'll have to take the number of layers to infinity. And then the limit is the spacing between the layers goes to zero is going to be challenging. Finally, it's not yet clear whether all fractal models can be given such a coupled layer construction. So I'd like to summarize with a set of questions that this, these developments raise. I think that every one of them is interesting. The first question is, are there more examples? And more interesting, perhaps them examples with more exotic phenomena. These phenomena are quite exotic, we're not used to them. We should look for more examples and condensed matter people are producing papers, finding more and more examples of these phenomena. The second question is, what are the underlying reasons for the bizarre behavior? The Hamiltonians we started with look quite innocent and yet they exhibit this strange phenomena. If we started with another Hamiltonian, it might or might not present this bizarre behavior. This bizarre behavior. How can we tell from the start that we are going to end up with such a phase? That's from the short distance point of view. From the long distance point of view, we would like to understand what are the allowed phases? What are the allowed? We would like some kind of an organization classification of the allowed behavior. What kind of exotic phenomena are there and how should we classify them? Normally, when we have phases, the way we think about them is we use continuum quantum field theory to describe them. We have a complicated system at short distances, and at long distances, we say it is captured or is described by a continuum quantum field theory. That's what we normally do. So it, we would really like to know whether these systems can be described by a continuum a, quantum field theory that would capture the long distance behavior. It would capture the long distance behavior in a universal way. Namely, it will be independent of all the details of the microscopic physics. And we would also like to formulate the theory on more non-trivial manifolds and make sure that these theories really follow all the standard rules of quantum field theory. And I can go on and list many more questions that can be raised. So we would like to look for a low energy continuum field theory and also review again why. Now, the properties of the models, as I've just summarized, and in particular, the mixing between the UV and the IR make this thing almost impossible. It seems to be against the spirit of the renormalization group picture where physics at long distances is independent of details at short distances. And here I emphasize more than once that we have this UVIR mixing. Phenomena at the lattice scale affect 
the behavior of epsilon distances. So if, if we want to do that and really find a continued field theory description of these phenomena, we need to extend slightly the framework of quantum field theory. And I emphasized before that this is a very dangerous thing to do because quantum field theory manages to be, it's rather miraculous that it manages to be consistent. But if we start making changes in foundational things, we might rack the whole intellectual structure. So we should be extremely careful. And we have two motivations for doing that. One is for fractal theory. We would like to have a universal description of these systems, a way to organize the different phases by focusing only on the things that are interesting and relevant at long distances. And the second motivation is in the other direction. If we do extend the framework of quantum field theory, maybe this will teach us something new about quantum field theory. So making progress along any of these two routes, I think would be a useful thing to do. So this brings me to the starting point of the work I've been doing with Shu and Shao. And we tried to do exactly that. So we tried to follow these existing lattice models and to give them a continuum quantum field theory description. And of course, we had to break the rules a little bit. And I claim that every rule we broke was essentially unavoidable. We didn't have a choice. So perhaps finding a continuum field theory description of these systems is totally misguided and we shouldn't waste our time. But if something like this happens, we are really necessarily have we'll have to break these rules. So what are the new elements? The first element is space-time symmetries. If we want to continue theory, we should have translation symmetry. And we should certainly not have Lorentz invariance. That's clear. But we are also not going to have rotation symmetry. We're going to preserve only the subgroup of the rotation group SO3, which is a invariant under 90 degree rotations. So we're only going to have rotation under 90 degrees. That would be the symmetry group. That is not shocking, and it's easy to write quantum field theories that are invariant on the under this group. In fact, we do it all the time. The second element is also not that shocking. We're going to impose this exotic global symmetry in gauge. This is a little bit less standard, but it's not too scary. And I'll show an example of this before. In fact, I mentioned already this gauge theory with a symmetric tensor earlier, and I mentioned some of these uh, uh, subsystem symmetries. Perhaps the most dramatic thing we do is to allow discontinuous fields. Now, normally in continuum field theory, space is taken to be continuous. Space is taken to be continuous, and we have maps from continuous space to a continuous target space. And what we're going to do here is keep space continuous, because that's what we want to do, but the target space, we will allow some discontinuities in the space of functions. Now, on the lattice, everything is discontinuous, and the value of the field at one side is totally unrelated to the value of the field at another side. So our fields will be more continuous than that, but on the other hand, some discontinuities will be allowed. Now, if we allow discontinuous field configurations and we study gauge theories, the gauge parameters and correspondingly also the transition functions will also have to be discontinuous. So we see that we open here a Pandora box, there will be all sorts of singularities and we'll have to learn how to deal with these singularities. And we insisted that whatever we do will make sense and will be independent of the details of the lattice. So let me describe the first model of this kind of tensor gauge theory. I already discussed it before, but a variant of this theory was first introduced by Shu and Wu, again, for different reasons. And it was called hollow tensor gauge theory by these authors. So in the symmetric tensor theory, AIJ is two indices, two symmetric indices. So it's a three by three symmetric matrix. If we impose that I is not equal to J, we remove the diagonal elements, and hence the name hollow tensor gauge theory. It's not invariant under SO3 because removing the diagonal elements is not, invariant, not a statement that it's invariant under SO3, but it is invariant under the cubic group, which is S4. So the gate transformations are as I wrote before, A0 is the standard gate transformations, and AIJ is, there are three of them, symmetric tensors with un, unequal indices, 
it's not the vector representation, so we do not representation is three prime. And again, we have the electric and the magnetic gauge fields exactly as before. And there are some funny representations of the QB group. And these authors notice that this model is actually unstable in the following sense. It's well known that two plus one dimensional ordinary U1 gauge theory can be described in the continuum, but if we think of it on the lattice, it's unstable because on the lattice we have monopole operators. And on the lattice, there's no monopole magnetic symmetry. So as we go through long distances, uh, we find this U1 gauge theory, but then we can have monopole operators in the Lagrangian. This is known as Polyakov mechanism. And what they do is destabilize the model. So two plus one dimensional QD or U1 gauge theory is not stable because of monopole operators. But in the continuum, we can study it. In fact, I'm still going to argue that the statement I made here is imprecise. So in the continuum, we can study it. So let's study it in the continuum. So we put this theory in the continuum and we want to ask what's the spectrum? Well, that's a straightforward exercise in quantum field theory 101. We put the plane wave we substitute it in the solution and we find it in the Lagrangian and we find the dispersion relation. So this is the dispersion relation. Omega is the frequency in Kx, Ky, and Kz are the momenta in the space directions. If we look at the spectrum, we have two gapless modes. Let's do the counting. In A0 equals zero gauge, there are three degrees of freedom in Aij. We have to subtract one because of Gauss law and we have two propagating polarizations. Okay, that looks, the dispersion relation is non standard, but these are two particles, two massless particles with funny dispersion relation. What's more interesting is if we limit ourselves to the special modes where Kx and Ky both vanish. So let's see what happens. This term is zero because Kx and Ky vanish. This is zero because Kx is zero. And this is zero because Ky is zero. So that this last term is absent. And as a result, we can have omega equals zero. So if we take kx equals ky and set them to zero, no matter how large kz is, we have zero frequency. And of course, the same thing is true in the other directions. This is quite surprising and quite unusual because it means that we really have this UVIR mixing that we talked about. This dispersion relation tells us that we have infinitely number of modes labeled by kz at zero frequency. At zero frequency, we have an infinite number of modes with momentum in the z direction arbitrarily high, sensitive to what happens at very high momentum. So this is the key to the peculiarities of these system models. In fact, these models with omega equals zero need to be quantized a little bit more carefully. And in this particular case, they are actually not lifted and they stay at zero, zero energy. This is not completely obvious because the variance of this system these modes actually acquire a large energy. So we end up with a very large ground state degeneracy. Notice how similar it is to what we're trying to achieve. Uh, we end up with a very large ground state degeneracy and uh, with UVIR mixing from what appears like a rather innocent looking continuum field theory, and I underscore the continuum. Now, when I personally, when I see a field theory, the first thing I try to do is dualize it. Maybe this will teach us something. So we can dualize it, and we can dualize it to a theory with another gate, another field, phi hat, which is not a gauge field. So all the subtleties with gauge symmetry are gone, and this, this field is gauge invariant. I don't call it a scalar field because it's in the two-dimensional representation of this cubic group. And the dictionary between the gauge theory variables and this non-gauge theory variables and we can hear the electric field is the spatial derivative of phi hat and the magnetic field is the time derivative of phi hat. Again, this is very similar to U1 gauge theory in two plus one dimensions where the gauge fields is dual to a compact scalar. The formulas are essentially the same. The differences are that A, we are in three plus one dimensions rather than in two plus one dimensions and the gauge theory has this funny indices rather than an ordinary gauge theory and the scalar of two dimensions Two plus one dimension becomes this phi hat in some non trivial representation of the rotation. So, the two gapless modes that we found before 
now get a new interpretation, they are simply the two modes of phi hat. So that's not surprising the duality works. And the ground state, the general state follows from binding modes of phi hat. This is again similar to what we know in two plus one dimension, where the winding modes of the scalar represent uh, these charge states. And the dangerous monopole operator is e to the i phi hat. So in two plus one dimensions, the same thing is true. We can dualize the gauge field. We have a compact scalar. The monopole operator is e to the i phi. And on the lattice, it is there and it destabilizes the system. But in the continuum, uh, we can tune it to zero. In this case, there's actually a surprise. If we look at the long distance physics, we look at the long distance physics, this operator is actually a very high dimension. And since it is a very high dimension, unlike the two plus one dimension of ordinary UHD, this system is actually robust. So it is not gapped as in ordinary U1 HD. Let's discuss the gate transformations in a little bit more detail because there's a surprise here. So the gate parameter was alpha and A0 goes with D0 alpha and AIJ goes with DIDJ alpha. And alpha is compact, so it's a circle value field. It's a circle value parameter. Alpha is identified with alpha plus two pi. And in a normal gauge theory, alpha can be continuous. But in our case, we also allow certain discounting noise. So we allow certain discounting noise, and the bulk of the work was to justify which discounting noise are allowed and to motivate them by a careful analysis of the continuum limit of the lattice. So we started from the lattice, and we very carefully took the continuum limit, and that told us what kind of discontinuities we should allow in the continuum limit. And this is a typical logic gauge transformation. It's not continuous. It jumps both at y equals y0 and at x equals x0. But you can check that it is periodic on our space. If x has length nx and y has length ny, then this formula is jumps as we shift x by nx or y by ny, but the jump is by 2 pi times an integer. This theta is the heavy side theta function, so it's either 0 or 1. So this is a good gauge transformation to study. And with such gauge transformations, fluxes are quantized. So what did we do with it? We have these discontinuous gauge parameters. And this can, and perhaps similar field strength, and one might get very nervous. Maybe what we're doing is totally, totally misguided. So I want to emphasize that the rules we have are unambiguous. They reproduce the lattice answers, and they're universal in the sense that if we modify the lattice action by a small amount, then the answers in the continuum do not change. Finally, in the paper to appear, we reproduce all this structure, including the discontinuities, by a couple later layer construction of ordinary U1 gauge theory in two plus one dimensions with a funny scaling. So that makes us more clear that what we're doing is sensible. So we discuss the U1 gauge theory. Let us discuss the ZN gauge theory. How do we go from a U1 to ZN? Well, if we have a U1 gauge theory, we go to UN by Higgsing it. So we introduce a Stokelberg field of phi. So A0 and AIJ are U1 gauge fields, as before, with a funny transformation law. And phi is the Stokelberg field with charge N. This is the N that appears here. And this is the gauge transformation of phi. And this Lagrangian gives us a description of the continuum theory. So let me guide you through that. This combination here is gauge invariant. And this combination here is gauge invariant. I should emphasize that this is a standard way to fix a U1 gauge theory. We just add such a Stuckelberg field. The only novelty is that we have two derivatives here and two derivatives here. Other than that, it's the standard construction. B and E over bounds multipliers, they set this combination to zero and this combination to zero, thus fixing the system. I would like to mention in passing that the scalar field phi can be dualized to another funny gauge field, A hat. And normally when we do that and we have this phi here, so in two plus one dimension, we find a BF description of the Z gauge theory. And therefore we can rewrite this system using a BF description where the F is the field strength, it is magnetic field and electric field, 
eh, what's normally called B, here we call it A hat, is this new gauge field, which is dual to the scalar field phi. And the coefficient N here, which determines the gauge group, which will be as the edit, so N here is determined by the coefficient here and here, and it's the same as the coefficient here in front of the action. This is determined by the same large gauge transformation that I discussed before. What are the defects in the system? So it's very similar to what we discussed in the U1 theory earlier. The simplest defect is a particle at the point. It sits at the point and it cannot move in space. It is a fractal. And since we don't have AI, its world line cannot bend. So this is a fractal. The second kind of defect we can have is take two of them, one with charge one and one with charge minus one, and separate them in the X direction. So if we ignore for a minute these two terms, we have an integral dx here, and a d by dx here, so we can integrate by parts. And that gives us an object like this with coefficient 1 at x2, and another one with coefficient minus 1 at x1. And that tells us that what we have is a dipole. This object by itself cannot bend, and therefore the fractal cannot move in other directions. But in this case, it can, because we don't have AX or AY or AZ, but we do have AXY, A and AXZ. So this combination is gauge invariant. Namely, the dipole of these two particles, the charge one and minus one, can move in the Y and Z direction. So we separate them in X, and they can move in Y and Z, but not in X. So this is a planar. So we see here that the restricted mobility follows from the gauge symmetry. There are also other defects coming from winding operators of phi, or equivalently from the Wilson lines of A hat. And the nth power of these defects is trivial, because it's a ZN gauge theory. Let's work out the spectrum of the system. This is our Lagrangian, I described it before, where E and B are Lagrange multipliers. The Lagrange multipliers set this combination to zero, and this combination to zero. So we can solve for A0 and solve for AIJ. This is the solution. So for every configuration of phi, we got rid of B and E by integrating over them, and we solve for A0 and AIJ. So the entire dynamics is captured now only by the space of configurations of phi, and we need to mod out by gauge transformations. So the ground states are the space of phi modded out by these gauge transformations, and they are generated by the same large gauge transformation that I discussed before. I would like to remind you that when you study an ordinary ZN gauge theory, you do exactly the same thing. And the way you count the ground states is by doing exactly this manipulation, except that you study continuous functions here. So there are various winding modes. And here, we allow also the discontinuous winding modes. So what does it mean? If we put a coefficient n out front here, then we can cancel it by gauge transformation. So we shouldn't do that. This means that for every value of x0 and for every value of y0, though we allow these discontinuities, we have an integer module of n. So these are the space, these are the space of ground states. And if we add also the other direction, this is in the xy plane, we can do it also in the other planes. So if we account for the other directions, and we account for the zero mode, the common zero mode, which needs to be treated more carefully, and we temporarily land, put it on the lattice, we end up with this number of states. And this should be a full, this formula should be familiar because we saw earlier a similar phenomenon, a similar formula uh, earlier in the talk. So let me skip some discussion of the properties of this model and just say that this is nothing but the continuum field theory description of the ZN version of the x cube model. So by doing that, we constructed the continuum field theory of this X cube model. And the price we pay is a small price by using this funny gauge field in fields that are not SO3 invariant, but only, a, only in representations of the cubic group. But the more dramatic price we pay is allowing these discontinuous gauge transformations. I'd like to compare this situation with a familiar example of an ordinary Z engaged here in two plus one dimension, uh, an example that many of you have already studied in a lot of detail from many perspectives. So I summarize it in a table here. 
And let me start by this problem. Ordinary two plus one dimensional ZN gauge theory. It can either be given an intrinsic description as a ZN gauge theory, or as a U1 gauge theory, x down to ZN. It also has a BF description, where in terms of U1 times U1 gauge theory with off the algorithm complete with the coefficient n in the action. The phase of the system is gapped. There are no excitations. Uh, the, the continuum field theory has no excitations. There the are only the topological degrees of freedom. And it's robust in the sense that there are no local operators that can be stabilized. The defects and the operators of the, the system are Wilson lines of A or Wilson lines of A hat, the other gauge field. In terms of the ZN gauge theory, they can be thought of as electric and magnetic lines. And what they describe is the motion of probe particles. There are no particles in the topological field theory. The motion of probe particles, and these particles are anions because they can have non-trivial braiding between them. And if we formulate the theory on the lattice, there are n squared states on the lattice corresponding to the winding in one direction or in the other direction or corresponding to the Wilson lines of A and A hat uh, along one of the cycles. Let's contrast that with the situation of our tensor theory. So first of all, we are in three plus one dimensions rather than two plus one. And it's not an ordinary gauge theory, but the tensor gauge theory. But other than that, this detail, they're very similar. So we can either give it an intrinsic description as a ZN, or as we did here, U1 X down to ZN. Or we can dualize the field and give a BF description that we wrote here with the information in which value n it has appears in front of the Lagrangian as a coefficient, very similar to what we have here. The phase is gapped as here. There are no excitation. This, this field theory is not topological, but this field theory has no particles. It describes only the zero energy states. And it's robust in the sense that it does not have any local operators acting in the space of ground states. The observables of the, of the theory are Wilson lines and strips of A and A hat. And they have interesting algebra. They don't commute. And the ground states are in some representation of this algebra, very much like what happens here. And they describe the world lines of pro particles but these proparticles are not just anions, they are these fractals, linons, and planons. And the number of ground states is also interesting. Here we have n square states on the torus, independent of the number of lattice sites. In fact, there's no lattice in this story. Here, the number of states on the torus depends on is infinite in the continuum limit. And if we regularize it, it is subextensive, it's term linear in. Lx, a term linear in Ly, and a term linear in Lz. So you see the situation is kind of similar. And it's kind of, the situation is kind of similar. And in fact, this theory can be constructed as a couple layer construction made out of layers with this Zn gauge theory. So explaining why it is similar, it also shows in what sense this column generalizes the behavior that we see here. This is kind of the next step. And that is five minutes. Let me summarize. Does this answer your question? <laughs> so let me summarize. In the first part of the talk, I gave an overview of the history. And the punchline was that fractals exhibit interesting properties. And they, are, they fall into two classes. One is this bizarre UVIR mixing. We have a large ground state degeneracy. Number of states grows, of the ground states grows exponentially with the length of the system. It's not with the volume, but with the length. And sometimes, this in particular in Haas code, there isn't even a well-defined limit as L goes to infinity. So it's not just that it's infinite, we get a different answer depending on how we take L to infinity. And the observables are discontinuous. So if we make L very large and the lattice is very fine, we move the observables from point to point and they have totally unrelated values at different points in space. So this is this UVIR mixing that even the low energy physics is sensitive to some extent uh, to what happens at high energies. 
The second peculiar thing is these excitations with restricted mobility. The restricted mobility mean, can, these are particles that are stuck at one point or can move along a line or can move on a plane. Now, all these behavior, funny as it is, seems incompatible with the framework of continuum quantum field theory. I think this is clear. It is interesting for many other reasons, independent of the connection to continuum quantum field theory. And although, the, as far as I know, there is no material in the lab that exhibits these properties, given that the Hamiltonian looks so innocent, there is really no obstacle to having such a material in the lab. And in fact, people look for it and even have some ideas how to use it to have technological implications or technological applications of these systems once they are found. So this was the first part of the talk. In the second part of the talk, presented the non-standard continuum quantum field theory. And it was non-standard in three ways. The first, it was invariant only under discrete rotations, only under 90 degree rotations. And I glossed over a lot of details here. There's really a lot of fun group theory that there's a lot of fun group theory there that is connected to uh, the fact that the group is discrete. Second is the exotic global and gate symmetries. This was this funny gauge symmetry. First, the global symmetry was the subsystem symmetry, and the funny gauge symmetry was this object with symmetric indices. This was the most dramatic thing that the fields and the gate transformation parameters can be discontinuous and even singular. Here is where we really were very careful because the bulk of the work was getting this thing straight. And we found what I believe is a consistent set of rules about what we are doing. And we made sure that not only is it consistent, it agrees with what appears on the lattice. These fields are more continuous than on the lattice. So we did not allow these continuities which are as bad as on the lattice. But on the other hand, they are less continuous than or more discontinuous than in standard continuum field theory because we are, as you saw before, we allow things to jump. And the nice thing is that these continuum field theories capture all the universal properties of the lattice models. And they reproduce the long distance physics and the properties of cold particles. That's what they were designed to do. And as a question of outlook, there are many things we don't understand. We'd like to make the treatment of the discontinuous field more precise. Even though we were careful, it's quite clear that this should be stated much, much better than we did. We also have these funny gauge fields with these funny bundles twisted by these discontinuous uh, transition functions, again, it's quite clear to me that this should be stated much better. We, I don't, I'm quite sure that this is not the last to be said about this subject. We'd like to put these theories on more complicated manifolds, perhaps the idea of using foliated manifolds and putting the theories on, on leaves is in the right direction. We'd like to repeat it for other known lattice models. In fact, we are writing a paper with the co-authors I mentioned on the title page, repeating this analysis for other models that exist out there and recasting the existing literature in this new language. What I think will be more interesting is to find new such models. So as a finish, I will say thank you and please, please, please stay healthy. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Okay, so, so I see uh, the first question is uh, from uh, Edward Witten. Uh, so uh, Edward, please. Uh, I just wanted to ask if there's any thoughts about using the Ha code in a similar language. Uh, this is an excellent question. I do not know how to set Ha's code in the similar language. There are various models that are simpler than Haas code, but more complicated than uh, the X cube model. And they can be recast in this language by extending the kind of gauge theory that we use. Specifically, the, uh, this is a paper we are writing with these uh, people I mentioned, the Pranay, Hotat, and Shuhen. Uh, this is the model known as the checkerboard model, which is in complexity in between the X cube model and Haas code. Uh, so this model can be recast in this framework. Haas code is more complicated for a number of reasons, and I do not yet know how to phrase it in this language. But this is very high near the end of, it's very high at the end of my, very high at 
open my agenda to, to do house call. What sort of ground state degeneracy is, is there in the more complicated models that you that you just mentioned? So it's it's also the, as a function of the length. It's very, it's it's also relatively simple. It is it, it grows linearly. It does not have the erratic behavior of Haas code. The special thing about Haas code is that the, the log of the ground state degeneracy it changes erratically with the number of sites. It goes up and down and up and down. And it's this complicated number theoretic function. But I don't think that this will really be an obstacle to, to include it in this, in this language. Maybe I should mention another peculiarity of Haas code, which is kind of more local. It's not just how many. So the, the ground state generally depends on boundary conditions and how many sites we have. The other thing is what, what are the local observables? They are not upper, they are not things at the point, but they are lines. The lines I described here are lines along the x direction or the y direction or the z direction, and they become various Wilson lines of the characters in our story. In Haas code, these objects are kind of fractals, hence the name fractal. So that I think is more of a challenge because this is something that is independent of the boundary conditions, independent of how many sites we have. The erratic behavior in the number of ground states come from accommodating these lines, which are like fractals, accommodating them with the periodic boundary conditions. This is the underlying reason for the complicated formula. So what we should really focus on, I think, is not the boundary conditions in the ground state degeneracy, but on these observables, which are these lines. But I don't have an answer because I don't have a, a continuum theory for this. Okay, uh, the thanks. next question is, sorry, sorry, do you have another question, Edward? Uh, oh, I just said thanks. Okay, uh, so the next question is uh, from Guillaume Pimentel, please. Uh, hi, um, so you mentioned this uh, UVIR mixing and uh, the ground state degeneracy as a signature of that. Can you see something related to the, um, to the fluctuations that uh, reflects this, uh, this UVIR mixing? The, as far as I can, well, I'll give you two answers. Number one, the UVIR mixing here is not the same as the UVIR mixing in non-community field theories where they come from the fluctuation. But I'll give you also another answer, which I think is more interesting. The, whether some of the phenomena here occur classically or quantum mechanically is in the eye of the beholder. Because if you perform a duality transformation, what appears classical in one language is quantum in the other language. So for example, when I presented the counting of ground states in the ZN gauge theory, I did it using the language of fixing U1 to ZN. And then the counting of ground states appeared classically. I just counted the number of configurations. In a dual language, when we describe this as a BF system, or as U1 times U1, the counting of ground states come from a quantum effect. That is true even without in, in standard ZN gauge theory in two plus one dimension. The fact that there are N square states on the torus in one description is classical. You just count how many holonomies we can have. And in the other picture, it comes from quantizing these phase space. So whether something is classical or quantum can depend on your description. And this is common in duality. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the next question is by Daniel Harlow, uh, please. Yeah, so in all these examples, it seems like uh, explicit breaking of space-time symmetries is, is very important. And my guess is that's really true, in which case it might be possible to, for example, prove that if you do have Lorenz invariance, this kind of behavior is impossible. Do you have any thoughts about that? No. Uh, well, you could say the same thing about non-community geometry. It's also some of the peculiarities arise because it's not Lorentz invariant. Well, that's what we expect, but do we actually know that it can't happen in a Lorentz invariant system? I mean, that's certainly what I expect, but I don't know of a theorem like that. I do not know that, but I also don't, I think that the more urgent question is, well, I don't know if it's more urgent. The question I find more interesting is what are these phenomena 
that cannot can or cannot fit in the Lorentz invariant theory. Other other such phenomena that are equally strange or even more strange that can arise. The lesson for me from all that is that there's a whole zoo of interesting examples out there that are very surprising. We didn't expect them. And they are there in theories that are not that different than the theory that we know and love. And I think what we ought to do is just explore that. Yeah. OK, any further questions? Make a comment? Uh, yes, please. Um, regarding to a space and symmetry, there is uh, the so-called uh, Carroll symmetry that is a contraction of the Lorentz symmetry with C going to infinity, such that uh, the particles invariant under that symmetry does not move. I am wondering if there is any sort of connection with these uh, fracton theories where we will have restrict mobility. Yes, so it's an excellent question. And in fact, I like to think of all of these developments as a Rorschach test. You know, this test in psychology that you get these ink figures and you see what you like in them. So I gave a talk at Harvard. And after the talk, a Gabadazzi came to me and said, these funny symmetries are like Galileo's. And of course, he was right. They were just like Galileo's. And then Kumran sent me an email and said, the same kind of behavior occurs also in topological field theory, topological string theory, occurs in topological string theory. And he sent me a reference. And of course, he was completely right. The same behavior is there. And then Jeremy Gomez asked me the same question that you asked me about, you know, it's the same as the Carroll symmetry. And I looked it up and yep, it's very similar. So I view that as good news. This is not so crazy. You know, we have already seen similar things elsewhere and we should use all the technology we know we can use from the other applications of that to help here. So far, I haven't succeeded to make any use of that. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is by uh, Rajesh Kupakumar, please. Hi, uh, uh, hi, Nanti. Um, this is more about the lattice formulation, uh, and um, uh, so the question is: You mentioned these Hamiltonians at the beginning, which are very innocent looking. Uh, so I was wondering: Is there a is there some criterion by which we might know which microscopic lattice Hamiltonians without computing the ground state degeneracy, uh, which shows these exotic behaviors, but without counting uh, without in some way estimating the ground state degeneracy, but just by looking at the structure of the Hamiltonians, is there a way to sort of uh, figure out uh, which of theirs, uh, which of these could have these exotic properties? Um, so the answer is a priori no. And in fact, in, this is exactly what I said here when I raised this point, I asked exactly this question. We look at this system, how do we know why the Ising model doesn't do that? Or is this thing that does not look that different does do it. And I don't know an a priori way. It, it, I think that it would be nice to have such a thing, but I don't know. OK, thanks. OK, the next question is uh, from uh, Juan Valdosena, please. In the case that you have gapless modes, how stable is the structure under the addition of uh, higher derivative terms in the Lagrangian? I'm worried about those discontinuous field configurations you mentioned. Ah, so the discontinuous field in the example that I mentioned here, the mass the the massless modes that we had are uh, stable against higher higher derivative terms as long as we preserve the global symmetry of the system. So the system has a global symmetry, and the mass the the large degeneracy of ground states is actually guaranteed as a result of the representation of the, of the symmetry of that model. So this model has an electric global symmetry and acting on the global by the electric global symmetry takes it from one of these modes to, to the other. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I see no further questions. Uh, so let's uh, thank Nati again.
Oh, uh, the next uh, talk was originally scheduled to be in uh, 45 minutes, but it was the, the schedule was uh, modified. So uh, the next talk will already be in uh, 15 minutes, the talk by uh, Ibrahim Abba. Uh, so we'll have a 15 uh, minute break now. And